very happy to have Sister Simone with us uh, this morning. And instead of a specific topic, she's going to be addressing issues that you would like her to address. So be thinking of what the seeds are that you're working about planting or sowing. Um, or trying to root out of your garden. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to be nice to them all. <laughs> okay. Crabgrass has its place. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. What? This must be speed goldfish. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, uh, the I did a thing yesterday on economic justice. I'm doing a thing this afternoon on immigration. But I thought this piece should be for you as to what you're curious about and what you would like to know. So can we just sort of brainstorm a few things that you would like to have conversation about, concerns that you've got? Now, you know I do faith and politics, and I do federal level. I'm not so up on Connecticut, though it's a lovely state. I've heard a lot of good things going on. Um, and. Um, then you also need to know that uh, the staff at Network, my little organization, says, oh, Simone, she'll talk to anybody about anything, whether she knows anything or not. So I'll, I'll try not just to make it up. I, uh, so let's get, let's get a few things out, and then we'll deal with them. Yes? I just wanted to say that I think I'm not alone in wanting to know just a little bit about what you're going to talk about immigration this yes. afternoon. Oh, phone, okay. Because because you're, you have to buy a location. And I would like to be in two places. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought Reverend Lynn did a great job about having your heart in two places, but yeah. your body in at least one. I thought that was <laughs> It'll be like Jesus in the temple, you know, with Mary and Joseph. You know, well, he must be with the others. If, if that's how <laughs> okay, immigration. Cool. Immigration's a hot topic. What else? What do you consider the most urgent issue today in global warming? Okay. Yeah, in the back. Uh, human trafficking. Okay. Yeah. The, the commonalities among, the, there's so many really pressing issues, and oftentimes groups will work so strongly on theirs and feel that some other issue should be lessened. And I'm, I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on groups finding commonalities. Okay. Oh, there's nothing like a new convert, yes. Okay, good, good point, yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the extreme partisanship that we see at the federal level and what hope, if any, you see there. <laughs> just keep writing. Just keep writing. <laughs> Actually, there is some, but okay. The back sustainability. <laughs> all right, and we're gonna have all afternoon. Okay, maybe, maybe one. Yep. Yeah, I, I hear it. I, I don't know that. What, anyway. <coughs> okay, and then. And our wars, which we seem to be in many of them. Outside of that, <laughs> it's a perfect place, right? Okay. Um, let's start with. Um, okay, so we've got about an hour. <coughs> an hour? Maybe. Synchronize my watch. All right, perfect. Good to talk about um, <coughs> Let's start with um, the polarization and uh, Congress. Beloved Congress. Um, because I think it also goes to that single issue kind of approach where it's my way or the highway. First, let's talk about the politics of what's going on in Congress, is that currently, I believe, there are three parties. But there are two that are masquerading as Republicans, because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have a majority. 
And that is one of the real challenges is that our system has been so uh, built up around this two-party system that we don't have the capacity to absorb easily another party because we don't have a parliamentary system. We've got this winner-take-all kind of thing for some, you know, as it's approached in uh, for congressional races. So what's happening is that the Tea Party liber and the Libertarians, Tea Parties, folks are a bit different from Libertarians, often have Libertarian streaks, but the Tea Party folks are about uh, fear and um, just kind of undermining government, because they think government's the problem. That's their assessment. The Libertarians think I'm fine by myself, just don't bug me. And the Republicans think we need simple, good regulation that can allow business to flourish. Now, those are three very different positions that make it really hard to try either to be the leader of three such different positions or to be someone, a Democrat or the president, trying to negotiate with all of those positions and get something done. And so right now, the, they, the Republicans, the way that the Republican uh, clump, including these three different perspectives, dealt with the Department of Homeland Security at the end of last year, I, I don't know if you remember all this stuff, this is where you'll find out she really is from <coughs> D.C. because she'll talk about all this technical detail. But they did not pass, uh, they passed a funding for everything except the Department of Homeland Security because they were mad about the president issuing the executive order on immigration. And so what they said is we're not going to fund the Department of Homeland Security, which is charged with the enforcement of the president's executive order. That'll show them. <laughs> now, the only trouble is that's also border security. That's a lot of TSA. That it, uh, the, uh, the, some of the funding for the transportation TSA, what's the, the airport people. The airport people, I forget what it stands for. Um, and the, the, as well as funding for the immigration courts, for all of these mechanisms. And so in a fit of peak at the president for trying to effectively use the money that is allocated in a way that really does provide security for our nation, the president prioritized a different set of people, folks currently coming across the border, as well as folks who are accused of criminal <laughs> activity. And that, because he did something on immigration, that made the Tea Party upset. And it's the Tea Party that the real Republicans are afraid of. Because the Tea Party is out about, it appears, destruction and running against ordinary Republicans. So basically, ordinary Republicans, John Boehner is an ordinary Republican. He wants to be a Republican for business. But he's terrified that he's going to lose the speakership by, because of the Tea Party. So he <coughs> held the key. The key to ending the executive order is to pass a comprehensive immigration bill. We had, and this was where immigration became so frustrating um, in the last Congress, is that we had the votes in the House of Representatives to pass it, but Boehner would not bring it up because he was afraid of the Tea Party people and that the Tea Party would challenge his leadership and that he'd lose being Speaker. He's a man trapped in his desire to be Speaker. And that actually has helped me have a bit of compassion for him because he knows if they had Tea Party leadership, it would be worse. That's his belief, and I think I share it. So um, one of the huge challenges right now in policy is that we, don't, we aren't able to have real Republicans at the table so that real Republicans can bring the business sense, which is creating this polarization 
and the dichotomy. Now here's what's happening, is that there are efforts on the part of many Democrats to reach across the aisle to find issues which they can work on together. Because we all know it's not good for our nation. Now whether or not they're going to be successful, this is going to be a huge, huge challenge. But wherever you are um, politically, what we need are your voices of support for whatever perspective you have so that we get some real resolution because our nation is facing a ton of problems. The funding of the Department of Homeland Security is just one of them. Now, if they don't have funding by the end of the month, then what happens is all people providing essential services, that's most of the Border Patrol, the uh, TSA, the, all of the folks, uh, the uh, some aspects of the, or the system that process the immigration courts, they're all going to have to keep working even if they don't get a paycheck. So after the, and, and this is DC, after February 28th, then they quit funding the Department of Homeland Security. My bet is that it will not be funded on time. But then the paychecks don't come out until, get, need to get printed until 10 days later. So the beginning of March, the pressure will be on, I believe, to get it done. Now, Mitch McConnell in the Senate has brought up the <coughs> House funding bill, which undoes the, um, tries to undo the president's executive orders. It can't get a vote in the Senate. They don't have the votes to get it passed in the Senate. So he's brought it up three times to show the House they have to do something different. Whether the House will learn, I don't know. But that's, that's some of the polarization. But it's all fear of the Tea Party. And to some extent, the Libertarians. But it's mostly the Tea Party. Because the Tea Party is just about exercising raw power and going after people who disagree. They do not believe that democracy is about everybody's voice being heard. They believe it's about their voice, period. And so they think they're saving the nation. And by saving the nation, they're ruining a bunch of the stuff that we care about. And, and trying to have conversation with them is really difficult. I've tried. I've tried. So, Can I yeah. Quick, quick, one thing I've always wondered, as we've seen um, this kind of polarization, is I wonder if, you know when they voted to get rid of earmarks? Because I wonder if, you know, and you know, there's problems with earmarks, but, I wonder if that helped the the whole system to work because absolutely you know then people had sort of skin in the game you know right, for right. their constituents and they were more willing to compromise. Well, there was some way to compromise, right? And some pressure on them exactly. to compromise, yeah. which they don't have now. Uh, I'm assuming many of you saw the movie Lincoln, mm -hmm. and remember that. I forget who it was, but they had to get something to somebody so that they'd vote with the president and all of this. There are serious benefits to that. The other piece, it was the only way that members of Congress could get specific, they meet specific needs in their districts, which they can't do now. And we were in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Congresswoman Betty McCollum came to, actually she crashed our breakfast with Senator Franken, because we were meeting in a building that was the, last, the result of the last earmark she could get. And what it is, is in a poor part of St. Paul, she got a building that was both housing, low-income housing, as well as one-stop shopping uh, for a variety of uh, services. And so there was a food pantry, the WIC office, uh, a welfare office, as well as uh, a job placement, and every one stop. And this training program, this, this restaurant that's a training program for uh, folks to get into the food industry. And so we were there for breakfast. It was a great thing. But she was lamenting the loss of earmarks because you, the members of Congress could target to specific good, knowledgeable groups, things that would work for their district. And so that lack of give and take is a real problem. 
Um, the problem is, is occasionally it was abused. You know, heard about the, you know, the bridge to nowhere. Yes. Sarah Payne. Well, there's that. And then, <laughs> there's that. There's that. Yeah. Um, I, I was doing a. Who was I? I forget what TV show I was on. And, yeah, it was an MSNBC show, and the, and they paid it, played a clip from Sarah Palin's last week or the week before when she was in Iowa lamenting about there's no such thing as free, somebody pays for it, you know, free this and free that, it's going on and on. And so they played that clip and one of my response. Well, it's ironic that Sarah Palin would lament about free checks from the government because you know, every resident of Alaska every year gets a check from the government regardless of any work that they have done and what they get it for is from royalties from the oil. Now they'll obviously get a smaller check next year with the oil prices, but the, the, the reality is that she gets a free check from the government every year and I'm not sure she, uh, her rhetoric outstripped her, uh, her reality which is a challenge. Okay, so let's, um, okay, so the problem in, in D.C. is this polarization because of the, the various groups within the Republican Party fighting against each other. Uh, for once, amazingly, the Democrats are fairly unified, but it's very easy to be unified when you've got this outside chaos. And my hunch is if the Republicans get unified, the Democrats will go chaotic. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's just kind of ebb and flow. Um, but the, the thing right now is to support anything that creates some bridges or lifts up the needs we have. I sometimes think we move too quickly to policy solutions like prison abolition because that's a solution. And rather what we've got to do is get people's hearts broken by the reality. You've come to a decision about the solution because your heart was broken by some reality. And Pope Francis in Joy of the Gospel says that realities are more important than theories. Prison abolition is a theory. The story is what's going to bring people to a different place. And so I'm encouraging folks uh, just to tell stories. As you'll see, I do. I mean, what I do is tell stories. And, but what happens is, is that it softens up hearts. And if you've softened a heart, you've opened a mind. And that's the, the connection. There's a nexus. It's not like you're being, you know, irresponsible, but it's making that connection. So that one of the challenges is in our polarized advocacy communities. Oh, man. I, you know, everybody wants me on their campaign nowadays. It's very popular <laughs> to get a nun. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, that, you know, I get calls from the Hill, so-and-so is having a press conference, could you get a nun? Uh, or I get calls from other organizations, you know, it's, it's a very popular thing. It's pretty funny. But, it's, but, but the problem is, is that it's usually about solutions. If we're really going to make change, we've got to commonly come together to explore the problem, not just the solution. And, and solutions will take care of themselves. And what I said in, in um, we call them homilies or sermons or whatever you call it, the little talk I gave, um, <laughs> that, that it is about everybody has a different call, everybody has a slightly different seed, everybody has a little piece to contribute. So, and what I think it is, looking at my own life, is when I'm insecure about something that I'm doing, or I'm a new convert to something, mm -hmm. then I, there's a little insecurity in that too, then I think everybody ought to do it my way because it's really wonderful and I love it and I want to share good news, so just come and do it my way. <laughs> and what you have to do is say to me when I get into those moods, congratulations, Simone, that's your part. I'm so grateful you're doing it. Because the reason we're part of community is because we don't all, it's not possible for all of us to do the same thing because there's so much that needs doing. Rejoice with me that I found my place, and I'll rejoice with you. But some people are so insecure that it's hard for them to deal with it. So then you say, well, what makes you nervous? What makes you nervous if, if I'm not with, with you? Why, why do you think that's so important? I was on the telephone with some, 
sisters, uh, the holy name of Jesus and Mary. We bow our heads with Jesus. But anyway, they, they, make, me, they make me smile because they're holy name of Jesus and Mary. And most of them are Jesus. And so, uh, anyway, um, it's sort of making fun. I probably shouldn't do it. But their, um, their environmental group is taking responsibility for a morning when their whole community is together to... Um, look at the issues of environment and sustainability because they know it's the issue of our time. And you know, you can work on any other issue, but if you don't work on this issue, we aren't going to have a world to live in and it's just wrong and it, we've got to wake our sisters up. They have no idea about what's happening on our planet and they don't care. And they're, rah, 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 rah. Mm. I have a few like that in my own community. So I am certain that the rest of their community has said, oh no, here we go again. Because these four women are very predictable in their community for insisting you join us in what we're about. And that insistence, their measure of success, I always ask, well, okay, you'd like me to come, what would be the measure of success? Is of all of their sisters, all of their sisters, cared about the environment as passionately as they did. Well, now there's a pretty high expectation. <laughs> it's also a little unrealistic, and it's also not the way God made us. Mm -hmm. And so how do we see our partnership as a community that can nurture the whole? And so it's nurturing the whole. <laughs> so I celebrate your passion, but you don't insist that I mimic you. Mm -hmm. I'll do my part. Let me tell you how I'm doing my part, but it's not your part. We need you to be the advocate wherever you are, but my part might be I recycle. I gave up my car. I did a variety of things. But because I'm not walking the picket lines, you might think I don't care. So how do we share the level of caring and share what we are doing? See that? It, see the difference? Mm -hmm. So that hearing the anguish, oh, and then I was at a meeting with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, and I was talking about the Pope's coming out in June or July with an encyclical on the environment. Mm -hmm. We're all looking forward to it. It's going to be really exciting. And Oh, this crowd, uh, the sisters I was talking to, I mean, you know, it was like the Holy Grail. It was fabulous. <laughs> and I'm just terrified. There, our meeting is right around 4th of July, and I'm terrified it won't be out by then because, anyway. Oh, no, but the, um, they were, uh, no gosh, I distracted myself. Oh, uh, so, um, and it's, Pope Francis is so clever. And so he walks towards everyone with love. I mean, that's the amazing thing. He opens his heart and walks towards everyone with love. And so he, he does this amazing, um, did this amazing critique of uh, the economy that we sort of did yesterday. Did I read his thing yesterday that he said? I can't remember. Oh, well. Um, and, and after doing this amazing critique of the economy where he's, you know, free market is not the way forward, that we need government regulation, that everybody, if we don't change structural poverty, that's the one that I read. But then he says, get this, if anyone feels offended by my words, I would respond that I speak them with affection and with the best of intentions, quite apart from any personal interest or political ideology. My words are not those of a foe or an opponent. I'm interested only in helping those who are enthralled to an individualistic, indifferent, and self-centered mentality to be freed from those unworthy chains <laughs> and to attain a way of living and thinking which is more humane, noble, fruitful, and which will bring dignity to their presence on this earth. In other words, I'm only thinking of you. But he does it with love, which I think is the key for us to have a heart for everyone. So when we get accosted by our beloved friends who just think, do it my way, do my issue, oh, and, and when you have a modicum of popularity, people just really decide that you I'm their answer, and I'm not. Congratulations to you.
do your part, because then I can relax about this part and do mine. And in community, that's how we build each other up. It's really important. Anyway, does that, does that help with some of it? Brain transplants I often recommend, but it's not going to help. <laughs> yes? I just have a question about how to recognize that there's a whole <coughs> that's being affected by it. So, uh, you know, I love what Pope Francis is saying and how he's moving us forward, but at the same time, the Vatican's running lovely programs on women's complementarity and disequality, and he's raising hey, the ordination. No, I'm not, I'm not saying he is. But what I'm trying to push is a question of, even though we all approach issues, <coughs> what we can do for them, right, given our own limitations and gifts, how do we then also get, whether it's a shared eschatology or something about the fact that I know that if, if what you can do is recycle and what I can do is drive a Prius or whatever, that, that that also has economic effects, it also has effects on gender equality, it has effects on racial justice. You see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, but I don't know what to say besides yes. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, we do it. We do it. Uh, let, let me talk a little bit more about immigration because that, that's one of the places where the nexus is really clear. Um, so how many are going to the talk this afternoon? Okay, I'll try not to say it all. Okay. Uh, but, but let me just do one example. Remember last summer on the border, we had all these kids showed up and young moms with infants fleeing violence in three countries. Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador, okay? Um, what wasn't taken into consideration is that there were two policies, two U.S. policies that create the violence there that they're fleeing. Mm -hmm. The first one is CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which undermined the economies of these Central American countries and created huge disequilibrium in the rural areas. Now, the, the free trade agreements are uh, negotiated by industrialists or by uh, city folk. They have no clue about the impact on r rural agriculture. But as part of the give me's is to get for Monsanto and a variety of other corporate uh, farming folks opportunities to get into these countries for their own production. And what, so that's the agribusiness is at the table, not the farmers. And so what happened, is, we experienced in NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico, was a huge dislocation of uh, the rural population in Mexico. So such that, uh, my, we have sisters in Mexico, my community does, in the state of Michoacan, and there are pueblos sin hombres, towns without men. Because in order for the men, the men could no longer make a living on their terreno, on their land. So what happens is the men leave, they go to the Mexican cities trying to find work, they can't find it, they end up coming north into the U.S. But it's a direct consequence of our North American Free Trade Agreement, which is a direct, uh, was the prototype for the Central American Free Trade Agreement. And so what we miss is that our immigration problem with all the illegals, which drives me nuts, is caused by our own policy. But the benefit of maintaining this, uh, the undocumented in our, in our nation is that they're exploited. And so it creates a situation where there's lower prices. Now we're in the process of, uh, we, the, not me, but the United States is negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership and, and another one that include Europe and Africa. Mm -hmm. And they want what they call fast-track authority for it, which means that the whole thing would get, that nobody can read right now, though the administration's now letting members of Congress come look at drafts, but you can't bring your staff and you can't bring pen and paper to take notes. <laughs> so you can read this thing, but then what the idea is with Fast Track is once they've completed the negotiation, then uh, it was expressed as slipping the, the document in, through the mailbox of Congress, and Congress can just vote up or down without any amendments. What we're saying is, is that it's not that the people negotiating these things are bad, but they only have their limited view. 
So their view doesn't see the intersection of the, some of the issues that you were raising about the intersection of the adverse impact on agricultural families, the adverse impact on land, the migration causes. Um, and so we're saying no to fast track. Don't vote for fast track. Because we need the, everybody to have a conversation about these trade agreements. They are highly complicated, but they privilege, yet again, those at the top. Now it's not, we can't do, now some people want to say we're doing away with global trade. Some of my oh, really radical friends, they just drive me nuts. But I smile at them and say, good luck. We're not doing away with global trade. I, I, I mean, you can't take the, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. The fact is, is what are the rules by which we deal with trade? Do you know we have thousands of rules for the free movement of capital? Which is, and you know, the free market requires, or a market capitalist <coughs> requires um, capital and labor. Those are the two aspects that keep this going. And the principle says labor will move to where the jobs are. What a radical thought. And then we export television every place. So hungry people see on television the possibility of jobs and safety elsewhere. Hungry people will move to where they have hope. Now, I understand that y'all claim 1623, what is it? 1639, 37, some year, in the 1600s, when hungry people who had hope came. Nothing's changed. It's just that we've got global television now that uh, spreads the word a little farther about what's possible. So, what we've got to get smart about is that if we have the voices, I think democracy requires that we have everybody's voice at the table for these complex right. relationships. Mm -hmm. So that the consideration is given, and then there's mechanisms for re to respond to unexpected consequences. We think, uh, these folks that negotiate these deals get into this secret mindset that they think they've got it all covered, mm -hmm. But they don't know the wallpaper of so many other people's lives. And that's the challenge. Does that make some sense? Yeah. So, so moving beyond fast track is a way to get that conversation going. It's a solution, but I've got a bunch of brokenheartedness because of the problems of the past. Yeah? If without fast track, if, is there really any practical chance that um, the trade agreements will get passed in Congress? Um, I actually think that there is. Uh, really? be, yeah, I actually do, uh, because the, the, here's the deal, <clears throat> if, well, okay, it's going to be up to the that Republicans. That hasn't historically been the case. The yeah. only way we pass trade agreements in the history of the United States in the last 40 or 50 years is through fast track. Right. Well, <laughs> but there was a fast track that was more responsible, that allowed for more <laughs> conversation earlier. But it's gotten small, the windows have gotten smaller and smaller. One of the things we do do with treaties is that around the, na the world, people do say, well, the Congress adds you know, exceptions for the US, and people just swallow it. So I, I mean, maybe it wouldn't. But I also wonder about these multi complex, multilateral, uh, non-state actor controlled agreements and is that a good thing for our world or is it easier to deal with or, or it, does it make more sense that we can account for more variety with bilateral agreements mm -hmm. I don't know but but why don't we have the conversation for me it's about the conversation mm -hmm. trade's not going away we've got to engage we've got to wake up to that and mm -hmm. many of my liberals just want, friends want to just say no trade, that's not, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but let's be real about what can happen and how do we include those who are gonna be um, left out in that conversation. It's a challenge, but I think it's doable. If we can do, if, if I can have 11,000 Twitter followers, we can figure out how we can get everybody's <laughs> voice into the conversation somehow. I hope. And then again, it's about creativity. We've gotta be creative in some new ways. How do we find new ways forward to, because the 21st century has so many 
factors that we haven't considered, but we are, in many ways, our law and economy is still built around a 20th century reality. And so we've got to find, and this is why we really need Republicans and Democrats to have a real conversation and not just yell at each other. It's because I think creativity is in the various views, and that's where, that's where creativity can come. Okay, um, which is why our organization is going to host business roundtables, business for the common good. And the, what we're trying to do is to get uh, business engaged. Uh, I need to be educated by folks who uh, run businesses. I ran a business. I ran my own office um, to serve the working poor in Oakland. But I want to hear other perspectives. I want to understand better the business constraints so that we really can find some creative ways forward. It's, it's essential. We've got to find some new ways. Yeah. If you could, if you could have your druthers, Simone. How would you see over the next five to ten years immigration reform taking place in this country? Do it, damn it! I mean, my, that's my approach. Um, there, here's the challenge with immigration reform: is that there's basically a consensus on everything except how we um, uh, regulate folks coming, future folks coming into the country. There's an agreement on border security for the most part. There's an agreement about undocumented. There's an agreement about the long wait. There's an agreement, and you'll hear more about this this afternoon, so I don't want to wade too far into this. But the place where we don't have agreement, there's a real tension between business and family visas. And there is a real tension about how much we can absorb. And one proposal is for there to be a commission who sets the numbers as opposed to doing it through Congress. Because Congress gets, I mean, this is our problem. Congress got uh, hamstrung, and so the fight is over the numbers. So we're still working with 1960s numbers. They were tweaked in the 90s, and but we're, it's still the basic models from the 60s. And our needs are very different. And so how do we do that? And that's where there's not a consensus. So the idea would be is let's get let's get folks again having the conversation. How do we move forward? It's got to be a combination of business and family. And then how do we do it? There were some good ideas in the Senate bill that didn't pass the Senate, but the House wouldn't bring it up. Would have been a help. Wasn't going to be perfect, but it was a help. Um, but we've got to we've got to find a way to have that that conversation. Okay. Uh, now let me look at my notes here. All right. Selective issues, commonality, extremes. Um, okay. The global, the environment, let's deal with the environment. Here's another problem where sound bites outstrip real, real conversation. And what I think with the environment is that we have got to get real conversations going on at the local level because politicians get away with their nutty sound bites because there's not enough knowledge on, on the part of folks around the country. And young people in schools are, are being great educators of their parents. Um, it made me think, when I was in about third grade, I heard that you weren't supposed to swear. I was at Catholic school. And so my sister and I, who was in first grade, heard the same thing. I don't know, it must have been some non-swearing week or something like that. We came home to clean up my dad's language. <laughs> Totally unsuccessful. Well, my dad, my dad went to saying, for the love of Pete, that was what he did. To, but it, it showed to me that you could uh, create some change. Kids can create change with their parents. And so I think some ways of encouraging kids to be missionaries to parents and relatives uh, is a good way forward. I also know that. Um, when we, when I was a kid, uh, my sister and I, I'm old enough to, we were Kennedy girls in the 1960 election. We were all excited. The, I grew up in the Los Angeles area, and the Democratic Convention was in Los Angeles, and my folks took us up, and um, where is it? I, um, we went up to the, the convention, and it was all exciting. But I had relatives in Denver who weren't going to vote for him. So my sister and I decided we'd write a, a, a argument for why we should vote. And I found it not too long ago. Uh, well, here is, I carry this. We, in my mom's stuff, this is where we found this thing that, that we had written for our relatives, is in my mom's stuff we also found the 
ticket to the Democratic National Convention acceptance speech at the Coliseum in 1960. We rode the bus up from Long Beach and got to stay up late. It was so exciting. Anyway, so we found this and the uh, paper my sister and I wrote with my sixth grade uh, junior high school typing class. We typed it up. And um, to convince my relatives to vote for Kennedy. And what happened was my aunt told my, told us later is that they, they weren't still convinced, but they thought my sister and I had worked so hard on this that they did vote for Kennedy. See, <laughs> 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 Exactly, exactly. But the, the thing is, I think, is that it, it's going to take us talking about the reality and our worry. And if you share as opposed to uh, the blame thing, but the concern, I think concern gets us a lot further than either bopping people over the head or coming up with the immediate solution. I'll tell you, I'm totally intimidated by recycling in some places because they have about five containers <laughs> and you're supposed to know which food items are recyclable or compostable and then what's recyclable and then what is actual trash which has the smallest container and then what goes to the shredder that doesn't need to be sorted what was the other one there was another one anyway it can get overly complex so I'm totally intimidated but I think the other place where we can be helpful is rather than blame is to ask people what they're doing. Because for the most part, I think everybody's doing something. Um, and it just depends what you're aware of. Our senior sisters in, in uh, Encino at the assisted living place, they grew up in the depression for the most part, and so they are vigilant about leaving lights on. <laughs> so they turn off lights and blame us for walking out of a room and leaving the light on. But we blame them for not sorting their trash. <laughs> so, so rather than blame each other, say, well, what are you doing? And affirm, okay, could you follow me around and turn off the lights? I'd appreciate it, because I just don't think of it. I'll do my best. But see the difference? Yes. Then if we scold. So what are you doing? How are you helping? What's your part? And that's where community becomes so important, is that you get new ideas. Um, and, and let me share this poem, because um, I did give up my car. In a fit of generosity, I gave up my car. I was ridiculous. Um, but my sisters, my community's poor, and my sisters needed it in Los Angeles more than I needed it in, in D.C. So in a fit of generosity, after a meeting, so when we were talking about our grim budget, I said to our leader, Rochelle, I said, oh, Rochelle, well, you know, I could give up my car. You know, because somebody, Ruth, who does home uh, health nursing, didn't have a car. And so, well, you need that in Los Angeles. So, uh, but I had the joy of giving up my car in November. No, was it November? November or December, I forget. And um, nobody could figure out a way to get it to L.A. in a way that we could afford. Los Angeles to, from D.C. in July. So I had the, the, the benefit of being generous without having to actually... Take it up. <laughs> and, uh, but I had figured out how I could get around on a bike. I could the places I needed to go. Places I needed to go were the Arboretum, glorious place in D.C., Roosevelt Island, another glorious place. I need green, and um, uh, Trader Joe's. <laughs> I had my priorities straight, but I figured out how I could do it on a bike. And uh, so <laughs> about. In July, a friend of our community's was coming to D.C. with her family, and they were going to drive back, and I was going to give them a tour. They were going to drive back across the country. And Joanne says to me, wow, you know, we're going to rent a car and drive back, but you can't imagine how expensive it is to rent a car. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so I called my community, and I said, well, here's an opportunity. What do you think? Well, they said, yeah, that's great. So three days later, I gave up my car. First, I'm a Los Angeles person. First time in my life since I was 16, I didn't have access to a car. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the first day I go bike riding to the Arboretum, it was really pretty funny, it's five miles. And so I ride my bike, I get there, and usually I drove to the Arboretum to go take a walk, 
Well, if you just buy the five miles. I was looking for a bench. <laughs> later, I'm biking to Roosevelt Island, only to discover there's this whole lake in the Capitol Mall, that I, in the mall part, uh, you know, near the Washington Monument. There's this whole lake and monuments and stuff I had no idea. And then I'm biking along the river, I found nooks of beauty that I had no ex idea existed. And I realized that in order to let go, I had to figure out how to hold on to what mattered. And so this is... This is a, a poem that came from this, Change and Surrender. And I think this has a lot <coughs> to do with why it's hard to, to change. So um, anyway, it goes like this. I had made plans for when change happened. I had calculated ways of engaging familiar nourishment for a reflective life. I had plotted bike paths, bus routes to wooded beauty hidden in the cityscape I thought, I can surrender this car, this easy, this piece of easy independence. I could once again let go if I held on to other aspects of routine. I could surrender for comfort for the common good. All too quickly, almost like death, the moment came of parting, mourning, and implementation of holding on only to discover all is changed. There are new nooks of beauty, wilderness and green expanse, new vistas I had not known. Plans and plotting allow for letting go, but open up beyond the tears, beyond control, beyond the death to life, beauty revealed beyond the loss. It's that challenge that we're facing on so many issues because we all have to change. Too often I've got the agenda where I just know how you could do it better. <laughs> and it's that challenge where I'm willing to ask, how can we do it better? together, where I put myself in that place of willingness to change. So let, how are we doing? Yeah. Um, so let me just touch on this war issues. The war issues are a uh, huge problem. And part of the huge problem is the expectation that the United States has to control all of its interests. And then once we've made a mess, we only have military solutions for the mess we've made. And that anguish of our nation and the anguish of people in other nations is huge. At the 8 o'clock service, at, uh, when we were asked, are there something we're concerned about, one of my big concerns is the Iraqi Dominican sisters who had to flee Mosul ahead of ISIS, and then they had to flee Karakush um, to Erbil, where they now have uh, in a school, an eight-room school with one bathroom, well, I guess it's a, a boys and girls bathroom, they have 1,500 people, oh, internally displaced Iraqis, mm -hmm. who are the religious minorities. Now, for all of the horrible things Saddam Hussein did to his political <coughs> enemies, he protected religious minorities. And they were part of the government of Iraq. If you were a Baathist, it was parties. It was like being a Republican or a Democrat, but they were brutal to political enemies. That's true. But it was political enemies. They had a working, functioning society, <coughs> which they don't have now. Mm -hmm. And so the anguish of the Iraqi Dominican sisters is trying to minister to their people in these horrible, adverse circumstances. The same thing is happening in Syria right now. When we were in, I was in, in Damascus in 2008, 
with uh, the Good Shepherd Sisters, the Daughters of Charity. Who else did we see? Uh, we saw another community that was a local community. I forget their names. Anyway, the the uh, Good Shepherd Sisters had the or had I don't know if they still do the first uh, shelter for abused women in the Middle East. They had a hotline for abused women to respond to their needs, and President <coughs> Assad had given them the money to do this work, and he held them up in the Middle East as being a fabulous step forward. It is true that he too is repressive of um, political enemies. But he's also supportive of women and religious minorities. So the piece that gets missed in our rhetoric is that complex intersection of analysis of what's going on. And that there are alternatives. There are alternatives. And I applaud <coughs> President Obama trying, like mad, <coughs> to do diplomacy and development to respond to the displaced folks. But the, you know, one of the big problems is, is Congress won't vote, vote him enough money for the State Department. Mm -hmm. Congress won't vote enough money for USAID to deal with the uh, refugees and internally displaced. <coughs> so um, sometimes there does need to be a military response. I'm not, I'm not a total pacifist, but too often we um, we think that we only have the military. So what we're proposing or trying to encourage is that we have more options as a nation, that we think of diplomacy, we think of aid, we think of <coughs> multilateral conversations, and that in that way we can get more of the complexity. And that the 21st century on our very small blue planet, we better figure out how we can talk to each other because it's not going to work otherwise. And with global television, we, global television creates global envy, which also creates a fear of losing identity. And some of this response is a fear of losing identity. The American global television sends the American culture around the world. And therein lies a piece of the problem. Because folks try to hold on to their identity because they feel it slipping away. And uh, we got off the plane in Jordan after flying, we went to Lebanon and Syria, and the first smell we got hit with was the smell of Cinnabon. And the first visual thing we saw was Starbucks. It's those sorts of things that make people feel vulnerable for their own identity. And they'll fight for family. And so, um, how do we have a conversation that allows for diversity, uh, for diversity to flourish, as well as for a sense of unity to flourish? And one of the big challenges with these trade agreements, which worries me, is that it goes to the homogenization mm -hmm. of so much of the world, right. which adds, creates an added sense of vulnerability. So we've got, trade's not going away, we've got to find a way to do with, deal with it. We have to find a way to deal with it that nourishes and applauds cultural and religious diversity. It's a huge challenge. And the military, I think, is rarely, occasionally, but is rarely the answer. Since we, that's our only, quote, strike force that we can deploy quickly, when we've got uh, emergencies, disasters, those kinds of things, like the tsunami, few years ago in Southeast Asia, it was the military that can respond quickly. Why don't we have a civilian force that can do that? The Red Cross gets there eventually, but it's our military that can move fast. So we need a peace force, I think, too, but it's a challenge. Okay, oh my gosh, is this helpful? I hope it's interesting. Okay, we have five more minutes, and I thought you just make sure. Okay, so we talk here, oh, human trafficking. Okay, human trafficking is, is another, goes perfectly with this reality because uh, when we were in uh, Syria and Damascus, I, we got to meet with um, Iraqi refugees and one mom of six kids, yeah, six kids, told uh, me that they fled Baghdad when her husband was kidnapped and then killed. 
And so she fled Baghdad with the kids to get to Syria. In Syria, they were given uh, a place to stay. I mean, the Syrians are, Arab hospitality is hugely generous. This family said, we've got an apartment that's not being used right now. You can use the apartment. Just an ordinary family. It's amazing. But the rule is that they can't, uh, refugees can't work in the neighboring countries. And so she told me that in order to support the five other kids, she felt her only choice was to sell her oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. And she wept. She wept. And that changed my, not my approach to trafficking, but my righteous indignation mm -hmm. that families would let their kids go. She felt she had no choice. And so if we're going to deal with modern slavery, which is trafficking, what trafficking is, we've got to wake up to these deeper other causes, the desperation, the hunger, the effort at change. And to um, have a heart for the 100%, the exploiters need to be stopped. But it's also families shouldn't be so desperate. Those who utilize, and it's really using, uh, folks, uh, trafficked people, we've got to get to them and stop it. But it's not just sex trafficking. It happens uh, nannies. It happens with uh, house cleaners. It happens with agricultural workers. It happens with a wide variety of folks. And the other piece that's really hard right now in our nation is it because immigration's not working, but where we find connections on both sides of the aisle is horror at trafficking. And so <laughs> we keep trying to expand trafficking so that we can get more people taken care of. But the really, really tough cases of sex trafficking and exploitation in household work really needs to be stopped. It's wrong. It's wrong. And, uh, but yet, we can't come at it just judging those who do it. There's reasons behind it that we have to unpack if we're really going to make systemic change. Therein lies the trouble. And that's why we need all views at the table. That's the challenge. Okay, let's, do you have, do you have uh, space for two poems? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, because I, I was just re realizing, one, one that I, this having everybody, and the challenge of making something new, is, uh, it, it's kind of fun to have my children in the back of my book, so anyway, here. Where's I had this one's kind of fun, Ode to an Unmade Bed. Anybody know? <laughs> I never made my bed. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, okay, the first one is Morum Conversio, uh, which is, uh, my community follows a Benedictine tradition, and uh, it's the daily conversion of life. You know, we're always trying to make change, but usually I'm trying to change somebody else, but we got to change ourselves. That's where it starts. That's the challenge. And... Um, the, and so this is the daily conversion of life, and I think we're an age group that will appreciate it. I've discovered younger people don't have the experience, so they don't get it. But anyway, it goes like this. The challenge of stripping wallpaper Oof. demands aggressive questing for loose, worn edges. Ragged fingernails slip under securing glue to liberate a piece rewardingly wide or frustratingly narrow previously applied in decorating fervor, removed in a new sensibility's disgust. Did I ever like that gaudy hue? Bits and pieces held too long need a tougher treatment. Spit, water, <laughs> determination. Pristine walls reveal 50-year-old notes. Wallpaper here, ready for a new design, a fresh start. 
I wrote that one, a strip of wallpaper with my sister. But anyway. Um, and then the last one to end with, because this, this is for me, is that we're in this together. And it's called Incarnation. And I wrote it in, uh, near Christmas, uh, like it was about December 19th or so. And we uh, were in Baghdad, and uh, we had gone, this is just before we invaded in 2002, we'd gone out to an Italian restaurant in Baghdad. It was pretty funny. But we knew that they had a generator so that we would get hot food. And um, we came back, and there was a <coughs> wedding party on the sidewalk in the light from a plate glass window. And uh, there was a screechy old violin and an accordion, and there were 11 of us, but they drew us in to dance, kind of this folk dance thing. And this one guy leans over to me and says, how long do my niece and her new husband have to live in peace? How long until you start bombing us? Oh, <laughs> Welcome to the wedding. Anyway, that night this poem was given, and, and I think it, it, for me, it's all about how we're in this together. And it goes like this. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, meaning of the journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution, risking reflective action in a 15-second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other all others to touch, hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need, to friends or foe to share this body's blood. Let love be our eyes that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. And let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy to welcome in the foreign stranger even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we are promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much. of a magazine, a journal that is published by Network, and this, and particularly if you're interested in what, work, what issues they've been working on, it, this is very informative, but I don't have very many. It tells you about the votes and the issues and how, whether or not they were successful, etc. So, Shannon, supposedly put one in my near library. Oh, good idea. And then it could circulate. Good idea. I'll do that. And we now have a copy of the book that will also be in my near library.